goal was to shoot it so that the, the head, the eye, the bill are all sharp, which this one is, and then I just wanted it to melt away after that. Once I kind of saw how they were flying in the areas they were flying through, I was able to change my position to take advantage of it. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Wildlife Inspired. Uh, today we're doing another segment called 10 Images, and today I've got a special guest from out in Utah, Clint McDonald. Now, Clint is a guy that I found on Instagram, I want to say probably like six or seven months ago, he started to catch my eye. And as I'm scrolling through feeds and I'm, I'm looking at images, um, there were a couple that I started to see, and at the time it was mostly barn owls, and, and I was really captive, uh, ca captivated by the way that he was photographing these owls and a lot of great looks and it's a, a bird that I've wanted for a while and really hadn't had a lot of success with. Uh, so I started to follow him and notice just not just the owls but he was really doing some nice work and it seemed like when I scrolled back through his feed he hadn't been doing it for you know 10-15 years. This is a guy who looked relatively new and by relatively maybe a few years so um, you know I started chatting with Clint really liked his style started to see what he was doing playing around experimenting and and really thought he'd be a great guest on the show uh, so Clint say hi to everybody hey everybody and just a little bit of your background Clint maybe how long you've been doing this is it a full-time job part-time gig for you okay well thanks Scott um, good to be on yeah I just started doing it as a hobby in the morning before work and um from utah born and raised salt lake valley um married have a regular 40 hour week job and yeah i guess for me it was just kind of i started out like a lot of people do with the point and shoot camera and um just kind of going out doing little nature walks what have you taking pictures of the moon, everything. And I did that for a little bit and then um, started, you know, noticing birds, especially the belted kingfishers. And, and I would see stuff and be like, you know, that'd be cool to get a picture of that. I, I think I saw a kingfisher one day with a goldfish, big old goldfish in his mouth. I'm like, oh, that'd be cool to get a picture of that. So different things um, led me to kind of want to try, you know, pursue getting photographs of some of the stuff and so um eventually my point and shoot camera i met a couple of retired guys they had big um canon lenses down on a spot i like to go and i ran into those guys and i have this little point and shoot kind of felt a little bit inferior and <laughs> so they kind of um bill and phil they kind of help me going and teach me about well this you know dslr camera this and that and then um kind of after that learning more of the camera basics i i guess started looking around on youtube and places to get ideas on improving my pictures because i would look at them and like why doesn't mine look like that guys or that guys and so that's where Eventually on YouTube, I watched quite a few videos. Um, I ran into yourself and Ray's channel and um, saw some of your stuff. And that really helped me, I guess, on the creative side. And yeah, that was about a year, year and a half ago. And um, just kind of kept upgrading my gear and trying to find, you know, new subjects, different interesting things, and kind of led me up to this point. Yeah, that's out at Farmington Bay, and it's all frozen over, and so this is kind of a, I mean, this was last winter, um, and it's, it's kind of one of the first pictures that I took afterwards i was like wow look look what i got his claws out and i thought man that's pretty cool <laughs> and so it's kind of a memorable one but also um kind of the story behind how i got it driving out to farmington bay 
um, early one morning. I think on the way in, I counted almost 90 something, could be 100 plus great herons, great blue herons, and probably over 40 bald eagles. And so what I did on this, uh, for this photo was a lot of times the great blue herons are catching fish. There's little pockets in the ice. There's little open sections in the ice. And then the bald eagles will come over and steal the fish from them. But there's seagulls and all kinds of birds. And so a lot of the areas are real congested. So I found this um, heron. He was kind of off by himself in a little pool of open water. And so I set up there, um, you know, because I had watched the eagles come in and steal the fish. And so I kind of, there was a secluded heron. And I just waited on that. And sure enough, he caught a fish. And then the eagle came in, stole the fish from the heron, and then they'll steal it from each other. Right. And it's a lot of fun. So that's kind of uh, the backstory on this one. And like I said, it's kind of uh, not the greatest photo. There's a lot of pictures of bald eagles, but it kind of has special meaning for me. Yeah. And I, I scrolled down on this one while you were talking, and I noticed this was with, uh, I think this was with your point and shoot. Yeah, this was, uh, it's with the Sony RX10 Mark IV. Okay. Which is, um, it does like 20 something frames per second, but it is a point and shoot, like bridge type camera. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it, it does a pretty good job. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely a sharp enough picture. I mean, you know, technically you could probably tell, you know, maybe if somebody had a, a 600 on like a pro body, but. You know, there is there is not a lot of difference just looking at this. I'm, I'm trying to pick it apart and see if I can tell the quality, but there really isn't that much of a difference between this and something shot. Um, and, and, and sometimes light has a little bit to do with that. You know, you can get away with some some uh, smaller sensor sizes with with more light. But um, yeah, a, a really mm -hmm. great image. Let me get on to this next one here. A very different okay. image. This was taken uh, a while ago, it says uh, 2017. Um, no, that, that must be wrong. Okay. Cause oh, you know what it probably <laughs> is? It's probably reading data off your camera. Uh, you probably never changed the date. Oh, and here, here's what yeah. I was thinking. I was like, if you shot this that long ago, something's wrong because this is definitely something that looks, um, a little bit more okay. creative than what you've been shooting early on. Yeah, that's, this is October 2nd of this year. So, ah, uh, gotcha. All right. That yeah. makes more sense now. Okay. And this, this shot, um, this is kind of where I started, where I was t told you I ran around, um, it's actually the Jordan River, and it's the Jordan River Parkway Trail. It's essentially a bike trail that runs from Utah Lake to the Great Salt Lake. Um, the river runs there, and they've, they've built the trail, and there's parks and ponds and, you know, all kinds of stuff, offshoots from this river. And so I'll run around there a lot, and there's all kinds of wildlife um, that come through. And so... This is kind of an example of, this is in the middle of the city. I was down there looking for some Cooper's Hawks or owls or something one day and wasn't having any luck. And then I saw just some geese. Oh, well, I heard them first. They're making noise over on the river. And I went down there and, you know, I seen that sparkle and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's get some of that. And then, um, so I'm watching the geese. And then I see this orange solar flare. I don't know what it's going on. And I'm like, swim into that. <laughs> and so sure enough, because um, this picture, I really didn't, that's really pretty much how it looks. I, I think there was a little bit of green on the right side. I kind of darkened mm -hmm. and, and brightened up the orange. But I just kind of um, saw that orange and they swam. And so it's just like a common species in a common place. Um, which I kind of like to do um, along the bike trail. It does kind of have its pros and cons. Um, it's, you know, people with dogs and biking around. Sometimes it's busy and, and they'll spook the animals or whatnot. But um, it's close to home. And you can, I guess, an example of trying to make a creative shot out of simple stuff. Yeah. And these backlit images, uh, w one thing that really works when you've got um, any kind of activity in the water. So when the water's a little choppy or there's little ripples or anything's disturbing the waters, that's when you'll get these uh, specular highlights like this in the foreground. So when it's really super smooth, sometimes you'll miss a lot of that. Uh, so just as a note to people, you'll hear 
uh, beginning photographers often say, you know, or, or feel comfortable shooting with the light at their back. Uh, but this is a great example of how you turn it around. You shoot back into the sun a little bit and those specular highlights will pop up. Uh, if you mm -hmm. shot this from the other side, if you shot this front lit, uh, you probably would not have the same effect. You wouldn't have that background look like that. It wouldn't have that orange glow. So yeah, really nice job with the backlight. Now I'm, I'm pulling up Thanks. your next one here. This is, looks like your eyeball to eyeball with a, with a burrowing owl. Okay. Yeah, pretty much um, right in front of this little guy. And this one, um, just, this is kind of one of my favorite photos just because if I'm ever, you know, in a bad mood or having a, I'll just zoom in on his little face and it <laughs> cheers me. <laughs> but the way I, it's kind of interesting, the way I got this one was just driving out in the middle of nowhere, West desert in Utah. And I wanted to find some burrowing owls and I noticed, um, this area, there was nothing and except tons of grasshoppers they're jumping all over my car and i'm like there's got to be there's a lot of food out here so i'm like there's got to be burning owls and i didn't see any that day but i went back and i'm driving down this little dirt road and i see something in the road i think it's uh, my first thought was it was a fast food bag someone had thrown out you know some trash mm -hmm. but um because uh this little guy had – he wasn't like this when I saw him. He had his wings you, – you know when a, like a killdeer does a thing with their wings yep. or they fake injured? Yep. He Broken was doing wing. that. I don't, know, I don't know if they do – burrowing owls do that, but I he had his so. wings. <laughs> <laughs> he had his wings all flayed out funny. And I, I, I couldn't even tell what it was until I did a double take and put the car in reverse. And I said, I think that trash was just looking at me. <laughs> And so I pull back and just get, uh, let's see, I got around, went around the back of my car, just got on the ground and he sat there and looked at me and then kind of ran off and never seen him again. <laughs> and you're shooting that now uh, with your new setup, which is what, a D850? Yeah, this is with the D850 and the 2 to 500. Okay, R really solid combination. Now, is this cropped in a lot, or is it just because he's that close to the road, you're just able to, to squat down and get him? It It's not cropped in that much. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, it's cropped in a little on the side, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty much full frame, and um, I mean, I think I was at a really low shutter speed because it was kind of and dark down is kind of in a ditch mm -hmm. my car could barely go through this this area there's like the big ruts you know mm -hmm. in the road you really need a lifted vehicle but um so it's yeah it turned out okay like i said i love i love the little face on this guy <laughs> yeah let's go on to this next one now this next one's got these mergansers really pretty uh background i'm gonna i can't really zoom in just based off of this but i can i could probably give the audience a little bit of detail because there's a couple things about this that are really neat uh, not just the trail of ducks but you got this little guy trying to climb up on his mom's back it looks like yeah yeah the little guy and this was i had my new setup the two to five hundred for this one but um i that's well i'll go into the story um this was kind of uh this was up in the tetons and I had I was driving home from Yellowstone, came down, and stopped at one of the little lakes around there. And I had it was really dark, kind of rainy. And I also have a lens. It's the let's see, seventy to two hundred, two point eight. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's what this is taken with. And when I saw these ducks, my first thought was, you know, I think. Um, these little guys might try to get on the back. Yeah. And so I was, I wanted to switch my two to 500 to get a detailed shot of that, but I was in able to, because there were so many dang mosquitoes. Yeah. I mean, they, I looked down and they were all over my camera and, and I thought uh, the mosquitoes would get in the internals. So I didn't even dare to touch it. And, um, this is kind of a, this picture ended up with me i mean like physically not able to drive afterwards <laughs> because there were so many mosquitoes i got bit in the eyeball <laughs> and my eyes got swollen shut 
And uh, it's kind of a lesson learned type deal. Uh-huh. I had a mosquito net and everything I left in the car. And um, yeah, so I, I didn't have that. I didn't have my lens, the one I needed. But I made try to make something out of it, and I got this shot with that uh, seventy to two hundred. Yep, and, and it's and really I, nice environmental shot as well because those trees in the background yeah. are really pretty. You get a sense of, uh, you know, where they are in a lake, and it, it very very nice scene. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to pull up this next one. Now we debated a little bit about whether this was a Cooper or a Sharpshin. I think we both settled that this is a Cooper's Hawk. Um, I, yeah. I, I remember scrolling through and catching this one, and, and I'm I'm going to guess this was taken just uh, this last year in the fall because of the, the changing color in the trees, and it's one of my favorite things with raptors. Uh, what you see a lot with raptor photography, and, and one of the things I think that's the most challenging part of raptor photography is the backgrounds. You know, so many times they're up overhead, so you just get these plain blown out whites or sometimes blue backgrounds. Sometimes you're lucky if you get clouds, but when you get color, when you get true color like this, where you've got a little splash of yellow, green, some orange in there, I, th- I think it just really makes for a great image. So tell us a little bit about this one. Okay, yeah, this one was recent, just a month or so ago. And um, yeah, that's what I found too. It's really hard to get them... Um, you know, with the nice background, I have a hundred pictures of, of these hawks, but there's so many sticks too. And Mm -hmm. like branches everywhere because they're diving in and out of the trees and it's just a mess. And so, um, this photo I liked, uh, one, because the Cooper's hawk is one of the birds I've probably spent the most time watching this past year. And it's so interesting when you're out taking pictures how much you learn about the behavior and just, you know, the cool stuff you see in them ripping pigeons apart and <laughs> cool uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and an interesting stuff, a quick story on Cooper's Hawk. I watched the, the male bring the female, this little, he'll bring her a little piece of pigeon and then mate with her and, you know, do their thing. And, sh- and she would keep dropping. He would bring her a piece of pigeon and she'd drop it. And then he'd go down on the ground and bring it back to her, and then she'd drop it again. <laughs> and it was just interesting. I, I talked to a biologist I met in this area, and she had studied uh, hawks. And she said, we don't know why he's doing that. Is, is she testing him? Like, are you going to keep getting it for me? Or is it just like a bad piece of pigeon? Yeah. She wants something fresh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really fun watching him. And um, this particular Cooper's hawk – um, yeah, I just, I got him on the, he was coming across a pond and this photo too, I used a tip I learned on YouTube that actually worked because before I got this photo, my shutter speed was really low. Mm-hmm. I was back in the shadows doing something and, um, I remember hearing, and so I try to do this when you're walking back to your car or you're, you know, going anywhere, if you're finished, you know, put your shutter speed up a little bit in case you see something and see some action. And so before I headed back to my car, I put my shutter at 1600, I believe. And then, um, started walking back to the car and I seen this guy coming across the pond and, um, I got him coming three or four frames that look pretty decent. And yeah. anyways, that's kind of that one. Yeah. I really love that. It's an interesting tip too. I do that when I'm driving for uh Raptors. So if I, you know, uh, I I do a lot of winter raptors. There's really not a whole lot else to do except ducks and raptors here in the Northeast. So uh, there's some sparrows hanging around and some feeder birds, but uh, I do the same thing. So if I'm just driving around looking for perched raptors, I just make sure I have the camera set up, knowing that I can always dial it back if they're on a perch and I want to go slow. But if I see something in flight or see something jump off a perch and go to hunt, I I definitely want to have that shutter speed up. So really neat tip. All right, let's go to the next one. We got a not bird here. So this is a coyote from Yellowstone, it says. Yeah, this is um, kind of my first trip up to Yellowstone. So it's kind of a memorable trip. Uh, Also, my first attempt kind of to get something other than a bird. Okay. And so um, this one is kind of about persistence. I think I got this on my last day there. And just, you know, driving around the spots, um, checking the areas. Wasn't seeing a whole lot until um, this coyote kind of ran out in the road and then just stopped on the side of the road and was looking around. And I got out, you know, kind of same thing, went around the back of the car and got kind of low. 
and I just like the uh, kind of the environmental, the colors, the softer uh, tones in there. And like I said, kind of my first attempt to get something other than a bird, and I ended up being pretty happy with it. Yeah, and you went with the same technique it looks here. It looks like a really low perspective. So you, are you down on the ground for this? Yeah. Yeah. And so so it's not just a technique for, you know, low angle photography. It, it does give you a different perspective. And certainly it, it, I always encourage people, whether it's birds or mammals, uh, think about their background. So it gives you an opportunity to include some really nice colors, especially up in the upper left and in the lower right. You've got some trees over there, but it added a, a nice touch in that background that I think you would have missed had you been even, you know, five or six feet off the ground or, or down on your knees. Maybe you get a little bit of that, but this was a, a really interesting perspective. It almost gives you the sense that you're looking up at them just a little bit. So yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, thanks. It's um, yeah, I'm on the ground a lot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, I mean, it's when you're just sitting there too, or laying there for birds, especially, you know, though they're not as afraid. Sometimes they'll just come right up. Yep. So, yeah, and I think that probably ties into this avocet because you have an avocet here that that looks mm -hmm. like it's literally walking up to you. Uh, yeah, this one with the bubble. Uh, this one, okay. If you want to know a little bit about uh, how obsessed with birds I am, <laughs> I'm driving. I was making an attempt to get more mammals, other than you know, more animals, something other than a bird. Driving across the causeway to Antelope Island, and I didn't make it halfway across <laughs> before I get distracted by a bird. <laughs> so, and I see the sun's going to come up in like 10 minutes, and so. I, it's literally for me it's like oh, um it would have to be something really cool you know with a a coyote or something to distract me but um i seen this guy he's down in the mud so he's walking in mud pretty much with mm -hmm. a little bit of water and i went down there and almost sunk to my knees <laughs> at one point <laughs> and, and so uh, i found a spot i could kind of you know not sink and just I have a little pad I laid out, mm -hmm. a little mat, so I wouldn't, you know, be covered in mud. And and this bird kind of just came towards me, flopping around in the mud. And then if you were to look on my Instagram, I have probably three or four other avocets mm -hmm. I've posted that are, some of them are different birds, but it's literally from this same position. The sun came up. And then I kind of rotated mm -hmm. and then there was one kind of behind me and that one flew into the sun. So I got probably 10 shots that I really liked, mm -hmm. all kind of different lighting and everything just off doing that, seeing that bird and pulling over. And um, I was probably there for 15, 20 minutes is all. Wow. And one of the things I like about this image is I always tell people sometimes it's just that little detail that catches your eye and, and finishes an image. Um, so while I like this image a lot without the bubble, with that little bubble that his beak is actually pointing to, to mm -hmm. me, that's the whole image. Like without that, it's just another avocet. It's it's nice and it's, it's a good look. It's certainly nice perspective and soft light and all that other stuff. But that little bubble takes it from like a, a good image to me to a really really interesting image so yeah i love those little details like that yeah and that's uh stuff like that's fun for me when i get back you know you get home and you're going through your photos yeah. and because i didn't really I, I saw a bubble while i was out there but i didn't know if i got him you know is even in focus when he went close to it or mm -hmm. anything and so and then you get back and you're like oh yeah that is cool it's kind of a little surprise and then this so. next one now we're back to another mammal so uh this is a, an american badger mm -hmm. yeah so tell me a little bit about this so, one. this is a really intimate look yeah so for me um this look is kind of because I know what happened. <laughs> I think he's uh, it's almost like sad and disappointed in me. <laughs> but what I did was this is up in Wyoming outside of a small town. This was on my way up to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And I figured I was going to sleep somewhere in my car in this small town. But I still had a couple hours of daylight. So I was at a store and I asked some woman uh, uh, that worked there if she knew where any, you know, wildlife or good spot to see eagles or anything and she, and she told me this park so i went down there 
And then I talked to some other old lady down there, and she said there were some bald eagles over here in a field, but there's a fence. And, and anyways, uh, she authorized me to jump a fence and go explore. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and I saw a deer. I wasn't seeing much. And then the sun is going down, and then I see something out of the corner of my eye. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a fox at first, but I got closer. I'm like, oh, that's a badger. And so I kind of get down on the ground, and I'm creeping up on it. And I get um, maybe 20 yards away, and then I crept up a little closer. And then all of a sudden, I think it's called a yellow-bellied marmot. Okay. You know what those are? Yeah. The marmot? Yep. Yeah. One of those shoots out <laughs> from nowhere, literally, I mean, an inch or two past my head. <laughs> and um, then this is the look on the badger after it, that happened. So I think I let his dinner get away. <laughs> I think he was like digging that thing out and then I distracted him. But. So I don't know. He's like disappointed. I just like the look on his face. And it's the first time I've ever seen a badger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so anyways, but he's pretty tough. I, I had faith he'd find something else to eat. Yeah, he looks pretty healthy. I don't think he's missed many meals, yeah. this guy. <laughs> he looks yeah. pretty healthy. All right. Uh, we're getting to the end here. I, I know we've got a couple more left. This is a uh, northern flicker. I've seen two or three of these. Uh, these come in in two versions, I guess, two spe subspecies. So this is a, the red. We have the, the yellow out this way. Uh, they call it a mm -hmm. yellow shafted or red shafted. Um, so you've got the red version out there west. Uh, but tell us a little bit about this picture and how you came about it. It looks like a really close look. Yeah, and these birds, this is one when I was, um, when I was starting out running around with my point and shoot, there were certain birds that I remember from when I was growing up. Um, the flickers, I remember those and the sound they make and the kestrels. And so this one kind of had a special meaning as I got better at, um, photography with birds. I, re I remember the flicker, especially when I was a kid walking home from school. I think I was in, I can't remember third or fourth grade. I found one of these birds with a broken beak. He must've hit a window or something. And my mom called a woman that took care of them, and so we put it in a box and took it to her. So it's kind of a special meaning as I got better, um, you know, with doing bird photography. I always had it in my mind I wanted to get some pictures of these birds, get some, you know, good pictures of them with the wings out and everything. And so with this, yeah, I know they're pretty common here. I actually hear them all over. Like, yep. And so it's just a matter of finding out. I can go to a spot and I know the two different areas they're probably going to be in whenever I go to that park or that, you know, that part of the river. So um, this one was actually on a fence post and I was kind of hiding in the bushes and he took off and went to the next fence post closest to me. And, you know, I hit, I got a bunch of frames and this ended this, up with this one. Yeah, it almost looks, and I know you don't use, uh, well, I, I should say I don't. I know, but I think you, you don't use like traps, like those those camera traps or motion traps or anything like that to get these images. So um, it looks like that kind of image. A lot of people will set up, you know, they'll put a feeder out or something and they'll put a camera next to it and the bird will fly in and they'll either remote trigger it or they'll have a motion detector that'll, that'll trigger it. But this is, uh, I, I don't think you do any of that, right? This is just kind of knowing the area that they're yeah. going to go to. Yeah, I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's the thing I love no. about and that's the thing I love about Clint. One of the reasons, again, like one of the reasons I wanted to have him on is this isn't this isn't a guy who takes great pictures that are highly manipulated digitally. Like you, 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 you use a Lightroom a little bit, right? But you really don't do much yeah. Photoshop. No, I use Lightroom and Photoshop. And in Lightroom, I know how to move the sliders, you know, <laughs> the, the shadows. Yeah. And in, in Photoshop, I, I know how to use the uh, dodge and burn tool. Uh -huh. And I think the clone and spot healing. Yep. 
Yeah, that's that's literally it. So you're yeah, because when we were talking about this, I'm like, hey, did you did you take out those branches and stuff like that? And you and you were kind of like, well, I kind of I kind of know how to do it a little bit, but I don't really bother with <laughs> any of that stuff. And that's what I love about it. It's all it's all like really organic stuff that's out of the out of the camera. The one thing I can tell you, just in, in having some chats with Clint on Instagram, is I think the one thing that has has made him again go from uh, a beginner to an advanced uh, wildlife photographer or bird photographer is he, he really does study the behavior and knows the locations that are going to provide good images. Uh, and, and this is a great example of it, you know, to get this image, I got flickers around here. I've never gotten a picture like this. I, I've never had an opportunity to do this. Um, but, but by studying the behavior and kind of knowing where they're going to go or what their tendencies are, you put yourself in a position to get this. And the only way to do that is to go out and observe. And I think that's probably a skill I'm guessing that, that, you're, that you have in, in your bag of tricks is just very observant and very patient. Yeah. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll actually, uh, for my job during the day, I, I I basically drive around a lot. I'm yep. in the car. Yep. And so I've gone through stretches where I'm listening to bird calls, <laughs> you know, and giving myself playing little tests like, what is that one? Uh huh. And so, yeah, there's a lot of that. I'll, I'll play, uh, you know, your, your guys' uh, YouTube video. I'll listen to that. Mm -hmm. And just different, all the information I can take in. But yeah, and then when I go out there, um, when I go to an area, now, uh, you know, if I went to where you live, I would hear birds. I wouldn't even know what they were. But around here, I'm pretty familiar with, with them, all the basic. And you can kind of hear, oh, that bird's over here. Mm -hmm. A kingfisher's coming. And so, yep, it's just kind of learning. That's a huge advantage. If, yep. um, just hearing. A lot of times you hear the birds, you know, way before you see them. So. Yep. And that's something I've preached for a long time is just understand. The better you get at understanding not just the sounds but also the behavior, those – those two things alone, and then studying the behavior. So it's not just knowing that the bird is there, but how do they act? You know, you talked about that Cooper's hawk and how it would uh, be in a position to where it's feeding. So you kind of you figure out this flight pattern and where they're going to come back and forth to, and you know, then you could change your position relative to what's going to happen and, and set yourself up for shots like this. So yeah, really great stuff. Uh, this is the last one. I I actually asked Clint to put this one last. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I hate him for. Because these, <laughs> these are the kinds of shots that I, I literally dream of. Like I, I have these barn owl images in my head. And um, I, I just think they're, it's one of those birds that it, it, for owls, you don't see a lot of flight shots because uh, primarily nocturnal. So uh, there are some species that hunt day side. Barn owl is one of those that particularly in winter. So this was shot in the winter, Clint? Mm -hmm. I would assume. Yep. Okay. Particularly in winter when food gets a little more scarce, they, they will become active. So short-eared owl, uh, great gray owl, uh, burring owl, of course, is kind of around all the time. Um, sometimes great horned owls will be out during the day, but these are like either nocturnal, mostly hunters or diurnal hunters. So uh, this is one that you just don't see a lot during the day and you don't see a lot of flight shots until you get these situations or uh, you kind of know where they're at. So I actually went to Utah uh, a couple of years back looking for these guys and I, I found one in a tree uh, that somebody <laughs> helped me find it and that was it man I was hoping to get these flight shots it was the warmest January in the history of Utah I think two or three years ago and uh, oh, the, the barn owls were pretty dormant during the day so tell me a little bit about how you how do you get this uh, eyes on shot I will tell you just in, in speaking with Clint none, none of these shots uh, that and I have a couple more owl shots I'm going to show of his are baited uh, so these are all wild birds. Nothing is baited here. So how do you get a, a head-on shot of a, of any owl when it's not baited? Okay, well, it's basically just uh, like we were talking about watching the behavior and everything. And I set up where it was going to go next. <laughs> and so this particular, um, this one isn't out um, at the popular spot, um, you know, Farmington Bay, there was a lot going up and down the roads there hunting, but I kind of hiked out further in this area and it was freezing cold. And I was just out there, I mean, three or four miles in the snow and it started getting, you know, sun started creeping down a little bit and I saw some barn owls coming out 
And I noticed, um, so when the barn owl dives for a mouse or a vole, you know, if he misses it, or he'll come back up and just keep going on the in the same direction. And so for this photo, by watching where the, the route they were taking hunting, I kind of did, you know, with the with the ducks mm -hmm. when they when they dive, and you can run up <laughs> before yep. they come up. <laughs> yeah, dive and dash. Yep. Yep. So that's what I did with this barn owl. He dove down in the weeds, and so I sprinted over. And then hid in front of him in the weeds while he was down. Well, uh, lucky for me to get this photo, he missed whatever he was going after. And so continued on his route. And I got this shot and all the way over my head. He flew straight at me. That's unbelievable. Because I was wearing kind of like camo, you know, mm -hmm. with my brown tones and down in these weeds. And he saw me at the last second and flew off and i did watch him catch a mouse and fly the opposite direction so yeah yeah this is a, this is a, a just a great picture and, and again you because of the uh the background it, it gives it, you you actually lucky that you had these dark clouds back there because it offsets this white bird uh mm -hmm. it adds something to the background so again it's not like a plain blue sky um it gives almost a sense of drama and having a white bird here instead of a, a dark bird really, really worked. So yeah, I love that one. So here's what I'm gonna do. I, I told Clint, I'm gonna surprise him with three images. So he didn't send me these. In order for me to show them on the monitor, I just had to go and bookmark his Instagram feed. So they'll be a little bit small in frame. Uh, so I'm gonna scroll back through. Now, I, 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 I put a bunch in here. Uh, I'm gonna tell you my top three. There's a couple in here that I saw that I liked. These are not my top three. This is one that I really liked. It was a burrowing owl in flight. Now you can't see these, Clint, so I'll try to describe them and hopefully you can remember uh, what, what they are and I'll talk you through what I like about these images. Uh, you had a couple deer at sunrise or sunset that I really, really liked. Uh, it almost looked like a deer, uh, a buck in velvet. The, the horns were just really kind of big and gnarly looking. Uh, so I, I had a couple of those that I really liked. Um, this one is the Avocet that Clint mentioned earlier, flying through the setting sun. I mean, this is a stunner. This is an absolute stunner. Uh, I'm not going to go into composition on this one. It's it's center composed, which normally I don't, you know, traditionally you would say center composition isn't ideal. But I actually, for this particular image, I, I actually think it worked really, really well. Uh, it having the setting sun, not not the full sun, not like, but like just that arch of the sun, silhouetting this bird. This is it. This is an image I would take any day of the week in my gallery. Um, and then I bumped one of my top threes. So I have this little <laughs> tiny. Uh, this ah god, is this like? It might be a wren, like a rock wren in the setting sun. This is the smallest in frame bird that I saw in your portfolio. Um, I just Are don't. On that um, branch that has the spikes? No, nope, this is a, I uh, think it's a rock oh, wren. Oh, I know. What, I think it's yeah. a rock wren. Yeah, oh, rock here it is. Yep, you, you captured it, rock that's wren. On so that's on the big old rock. Yeah, on, on the big okay. rock, yep, with the setting sun. I just thought this was a really pretty uh, scene. And uh, again, showing that you're uh, kind of, in a year, you've gone from adapting your style and now you're getting comfortable with a lot of different looks. So it's not just you know, a bird portrait or a bird on a stick, you know, we call it bird on a stick a lot, you know, these mm -hmm. bird portraits, but you're getting out and you're looking at different focal lengths, you're looking at different lighting. And again, having only done it for about a year, a year and a half, uh, I'm pulling up a Pelican that really worked well. And this is in direct light. So this isn't the ideal tone or color for light, but this you exposed here for the highlights. And so you've got these really well-defined specular highlights uh, and a backlit, uh, American white pelican. Yeah, sometimes I say species like in these shows and then I watch them <laughs> back and I'm like, what the hell did I call that species? So sometimes I just have to slow down and make sure I get it right. I think I got this one right. American white pelican. Okay. Uh, and yeah. a ton of these specular highlights. But then the background, because we're exposing for those highlights, the background is black. And uh, I don't think that's edited that way. I mean, I, you may have enhanced it, but I, I think that's probably pretty much what, what happened out of camera once you exposed for those highlights. Um, so really yeah, love that there, one. Yeah, there, there was uh, around the bird, and it's all dark like that. There were some weeds kind of up higher. Um, but yeah, that, I just um, did the exposure compensation down, yep. you know, so. Yeah. And then I've got another bar now here. Now, this isn't my favorite one. 
uh, but this is probably from that same night. It's a little bit smaller in frame. He's His face is in shadow, but it, it really works. It's not quite a silhouette, but it, it almost looks like a composite. And again, I know it's not uh, because it's that good. You know, it's just a really, really pretty scene and the symmetry on it is really outstanding. So uh, I'm going to get to my top three here now, though. Okay. Uh, you can't see this one, but this says it's it's captioned at Hayden Valley Yellowstone National Park. This is a big old what is, is this a uh, elk? I think I might have called the other one a deer, but it was it was an elk. Oh, it's an elk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got a you've got a big old elk here uh, in setting sun. You had two of them. One was a little more scenic, and one was a little tighter. I, I picked the tighter as one of my top three. In uh, just a great pose, he's looking back into the frame. Um, mm -hmm. the light is gorgeous. It's composed just right. So I really, really, really loved that one. That's one of my top three. Uh, this one I added in, this is your, uh, your magpie from like last week. Oh I think. yeah. Yeah. I put that yeah. in I told Clint, put this in a contest and he's like, I've never entered a contest before. I'm like, well, try this one and see how it does. <laughs> because these are the kind of images that actually win contests when you get these incredibly unique poses, um, especially things that involve symmetry. So this is a really, really symmetrical bird. And it's not, even though magpies out there are pretty common, it's mm -hmm. not, I've never seen this image before. So I've never seen a magpie like this. And it worked really, really well because their tails are so long to begin with that when it fanned it out like this, it's head on and the symmetry is just really tight. So um, I love this one. Yeah, that that is all yeah. about the pose and really, really well done. And my Thanks. favorite image, and this is the one that actually put me on the Clint McDonald fan club is the barn owl uh, with a mouse feet down uh flying pretty much right at, i think it's a mouse it might be a vole uh he's got a little guy anyway and yeah. coming and i saw this and i i just i hated you for this like i hated you <laughs> so much because this is the shot that i went to utah to get and i came back with like nothing uh but man and he's got like a little catch light in his eye on one side a little out of focus uh grasses below you know, nice background, but uh, gorgeous, gorgeous image. So that's my favorite all-time Clint McDonald image right there. <laughs> well, thanks, Scott. <laughs> and I know um, other than the hate, I guess, no. <laughs> no, that's understandable because uh, some of the shots I've got, you know, people, uh, they've been at it for quite a long time, and they've never even seen a badger, for instance. Yep. And so I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. Yeah. yeah and that's the thing that's impressive. And, and I get back to it. It's just, you just haven't been doing it for years. So to get, you know, this is a shot like this to me is, you know, it takes years and years and years to get this shot. And, you know, maybe in your first, second year of doing it, you know, you, you managed to get a really impressive uh, raptor, you know, head, eyes on, prey, legs down, wings up. I mean, it's just, man, that's a good one. So. Uh, um, one one thing I will yeah. say is though um, about you know talking about how I progressed quickly like this, I take a lot of pictures, and I say, for me, it's kind of like playing a video game. You know, no one I never really had any classes or lessons, but how how did I get be uh, better at video games? I just I would play every day. I'd, yep. you know, go out there. And, <laughs> so that's what I do with the camera. It's just like a big video game controller. In my hand. Yeah. And you take a lot of pictures. Yep. Practice, practice. So. Yep. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I've always told people is it's not just, um, you know, if you go out on your own and, and you do that, that's certainly a huge part of it. But it's just being adaptable and learning and listening and, you know, not getting locked into one thing. Uh, I've talked about this with other other guests, but you know, your personal preferences may be a little bit different than somebody else's, but there's no right or wrong way to create a great image. Um, sometimes great images are just great images. And, it, you know, whether you use a tripod or a monopod or a sling or your handhold or you use back button focus or, you know, you shoot high ISO, all of that stuff is more personal preference. There aren't a ton of rules to this. Um, there are some guidelines, but once you get it within those guidelines, I think there's a lot of different ways to create great images. But the only way to do it is to be out there and work it. And the more you put yourself out there, uh, sometimes putting yourself out there in tougher conditions, like you had mentioned, being out in the snow, 
uh, will lead to shots that nobody else is getting because you're willing to do things that other people won't. So uh, I really commend you for that, Clint. I think you've done a, a great job in a short period of time. Uh, specifically, I chose you as a, as a guest because I wanted people to see that somebody that, that hasn't been doing it for 10 or 20 years can take images like, like the one basically I've got up on the screen now and just scrolling through, like go through Clint's Instagram feed if you're on Instagram or you know check him out and you're gonna see images in here that are just really, really impressive. So uh, that's the thing that always stood out to me was just you know how quickly you've learned and how quickly you've adapted uh, and, and trying new things and being creative all within that first couple years of doing it. So really impressive job. I had a couple questions come Thanks. in, Clint. Um, okay. So, well, Terry Terry liked your comparison with video games. I will say, I kind of agree with that though. It, it, it is like a challenge. I, I also equate like when I'm doing species sometimes to like Pokemon where you just, you know, it's like, <laughs> are you gonna open the pack that gets the, the really rare card today? Um, also wanted to know if you're traveling anywhere. Most of your stuff is from Utah and I think Montana. Is that accurate? Yeah, pretty much uh, Utah um, on the way to Yellowstone and back. <laughs> okay. A uh, little bit in the Tetons. A lot. I got some hawks coming through Idaho. There's a lot of birds up there. Yep. So just this area so far, yeah. Okay. Is there anywhere that you, you want to go or you plan on going or anything you want to do next? Or do you have any goals, any species? Or like if you had to say, hey, the next thing I want to do is this, what would it be? Um, Probably go for like the great gray owls. Yep. Just because they're cool. I've actually never seen one. Well, you have pretty good um, luck with so owls. So if you go for great grays, <laughs> let me know because I may join you. you. You seem to be pretty good with them. Yeah, I, I looked for them when I, I was up in Yellowstone, and the last time I went, they actually closed the main road. I was trying to get in, and I didn't end up being able to drive in the park, but I'll find them sooner or later. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, listen, Clint, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on mute for, for the rest of the show. I'm going to do a couple of things with the tell, talk about what's coming up for the rest of the show, uh, and then we'll call it a night. But I really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I think it was a really good episode. So say good night to everybody. I'm going to put you on mute and then just do a couple of housekeeping things. Okay. Well, thank you for having me as well. And we'll talk to everybody later. Thanks. All right. And uh, so, guys, the, the next thing that we're going to run, uh, the next series I'm going to run is actually a series on composition. So I'm, I'm breaking these episodes down so that we do some interviews with, with uh, guests. We do, do some kind of like behind the scenes. And then we do a little bit of learning. Uh, so my next one is actually on composition. Uh, for no reason, I have this image up right now. It's I was torn back and forth between black and white. Um, I was submitting this into a contest for a specific category. And uh, I was playing around with this on the monitor before. And I had a black and white version and a color version. The color version actually has really good light. But um, I haven't done a lot of black and whites. And I thought maybe it would play well. So if you hate this, let me know if you love this. Uh, make me feel good about a decision I just made today. I also wanted to share before I leave today a uh, couple things we're going to do. So composition is the next episode. It'll actually be at least two parts, maybe three. I'm going to do uh, basic composition, rule of thirds, stuff like that. I think that'll be a really, really helpful episode. I'd like to get a lot of people on for that one. Uh, then we'll do a little bit more, which is kind of like beyond the rule of thirds. So talking about different compositions, um, things that are smaller in frame, maybe uh, golden spiral, all the other different compositional techniques. Uh, so we'll talk about that. I'll have a special guest on for that one. Uh, hopefully I've got I've got three people in mind, but I'm hoping that the one that committed will be able to do it uh, on my time frame. And then I've also got um, a show that we'll do a critique about composition. So we'll run a critique episode, which will be having uh, users submit. Uh, speaking of users, I did want to share three images from Patreon. So I do run the Patreon site. I'm not going to plug it heavy tonight, uh, but I do want to say if you're interested in that, just check out uh, Wildlife Inspired or S Keys Images on Patreon.com, and it'll give you a sense for what I do. But these are three people that I've been working with, and uh, these are my top three images. So each month I, I do edits. So I do these real-time edits, I take videos, I send them back to people. A couple of these people, you know, have really, really grown. And I picked three that I just wanted to share with the group just to show you um, some of the things that I'm doing uh, outside the Wildlife Inspired. This is a really great image from Marcus V. Um, he sent me this as an edit. He wanted to know, you know, what could, what would I do with it? How would I adapt this? Um, it wasn't really a whole lot. This was really, really, really good. 
So I didn't have to do a whole lot to this image at all. Uh, I'll tell you what I loved about it though, is he's got this great background and it's it's a hint of, of these orange colors back there and these pine needles are framing it. And then as, as just like a bonus, there's a little rain uh, and condensation on the ends of the tips of the pines. So uh, Marcus V was one of my top three uh, submissions for the month. My second one was from Katie. Uh, she sent me this wood duck and it was funny. She did the edit. She sent it to me and wanted to know what I thought of it. I blindly did an edit and it looked almost identical. So um, she's she's getting really good at these edits. Real subtle stuff, but just, just popping. And when you're doing portraits, I think that's where these little subtle pops of uh, your color and dodging and burning and, and playing with the backgrounds nothing major here there's not like any major edits happening here it's all real super subtle stuff that brings out the bird uh, so i thought this was a great little portrait of a female wood duck from katie and then my my favorite one of the month was from uh, alicia s and she sent me this burrowing owl which blew me away because she had told me hey i'm gonna go look for burrowing owls and when she said that i i kind of expected to see what I've seen uh, from a lot of burrowing owls, which is which is an owl in a burrow or on grass or with these, you know, kind of very similar settings. Uh, when she sent me this as a critique and edit, I was blown away because I'd never seen a burrowing owl in a setting like this. And what struck me is this. This is almost zero editing. There's there's certainly a little bit of dodging and burning happening here. But the impressive thing was the the work that she did in camera. So if you look, um, let me let me get my mug off here. If you look here, you can see this perch is kind of nestled in between this V of the rocks. And then you've got this gorgeous background. And when it composes, it really does compose so that you've got kind of a third of a block of sky, a third of a block of these darker reddish mountains, and then a third uh, committed to these foreground rocks. Uh, and then the bird just really stands off. And the fact that he's not making eye contact doesn't really matter because his eyes are actually looking up at the same angle. It's almost like he's looking at something imaginary up on top of this rock. So the whole scene just plays together beautifully. Uh, so that was my favorite image uh, from my Patreon site this month. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you can send me a message, Eskies Images on Instagram. You could send me messages here, uh, or you can actually just look into the Patreon site and let me know what you think. Uh, I'm always available to answer questions, and I, I, you, know, you guys know I love this stuff. So I'm always available to talk or chat, uh, shop about birds, wildlife, and photography. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I'd like to just um, thank Clint for joining me today. Uh, next couple episodes are going to be committed to composition, so it'll be a little bit more of a learning series. And then I'll get back into some of these uh, top 10 and critiques. So I'm going to sign off. Thanks for, for joining everybody, and have a great night.